time for questions to the Executive Office, and we will start with listed questions. Before I call the first mem member to ask a question, could I remind members to keep rising in their places if they wish to ask a supplementary question? I call Ms Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question one, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your, your permission, I will ask uh, Junior Minister Fearon to answer this question. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions 1 and 11 together. A headline action under Together Building an Outed Community was to develop a summer camps pilot programme consisting of 100 summer camps. This target was achieved with 101 summer camps being delivered in 2015 16. The summer camp programme, 16 17, opened for applications on 15 March 2016 and letters of offer were accepted by 103 groups. Summer camps are about building positive relationships among young people aged 11 to 19 on a cross-community basis. They represent an investment of 1.2 million by the executive and approximately 4,000 young people have participated and benefited from programs this year. Along with Junior Minister Ross, I've had the opportunity to visit a number of camps myself. The young people involved have demonstrated an appetite to take an active role in shaping our society. The summer camp programme allows young people to understand each other's perspectives and make new friendships. The programme is helping to create a shared society based on good relations and reconciliation. A reunion event will also be held in early 2017, which will bring all camp participants together and provide an opportunity to further develop friendships and celebrate achievements. I'm delighted to be involved with this programme, which has provided an opportunity to our young people to get to know each other through new, enjoyable and shared experiences. Well, Ms. Bunting for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Might I ask her, um, I take note that she's mentioned a reunion event, but beyond that, what mechanisms are in place um, to ensure that these established relationships are built upon and maintained? Well, thank the member for her question. As I said, um, myself and Junior Minister Ross have visited many of the camps, and that's been a hugely rewarding um, experience to engage with those young people and hear their views and get feedback. Um, about the friendship they've made and friendships which have actually taken on a life of their own thanks to social media. Um, the young people have said themselves that perhaps the residential was the most rewarding part for them, spending so much time together in, in those short few days. Um, but I, I do think the participation in the camps is evidence of the fact that both young people and parents want to work together and want to try and build a, a, a better society and based on friendship. Um, last year's pilot showed us that 95% of young people actually made new friendships and 85% of them wanted to stay in touch. And I think that we do need to do everything we can to facilitate that. Um, and the member did mention a reunion event that we're holding next year. But beyond that, I think it would be important for us to get some even parental feedback to see if we could get a broader picture and try and make next year's programmes even better. Call Mr Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, of the 103 camps that took place, how many of them were already going to take place and how many were new initiatives brought about by TBUC? Well, um, all of the summer camps were, were new summer camps. There was uh, summer camps held in every one of the 18 Assembly constituencies, um, and there has been positive feedback from all of those. The summer camps were delivered in association with the um, Education Authority, and the districts were based on the old Education Library Board regions, so um, the summer camps were spread regionally across. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the Junior Minister for the response which she's given. And can I say to her that uh, while I welcome uh, what summer camps do, particularly in creating and fostering friendships, can she tell the House how ever those friendships can develop into genuine reconciliation between communities in Northern Ireland, and is that aspect of uh, the Together Building United Community summer camps being audited by the, de by the department? Um, well, the summer camps were very much designed in a co-design approach, and alongside of that process, there was young people involved at every stage of the of the design approach to try and develop each each stage. Um, in accordance with what they feel uh, would have benefited them the most and they were involved with that from the very beginning and I think it is important that we do put a focus on um, beyond the summer camps and trying to put initiatives in place for our young people to maintain those friendships and as I said before a lot of the friendships have taken shape naturally but beyond that I do think it is important that we put um, mechanisms in place. Mm -hmm. 
or for Fregers and Hurchi Gaji Shaw. Could I ask the Minister uh, what rural proofing measures were taken to ensure access to the summer camp programme in all areas, not just urban? I thank the member for his question. Um, and it's always been the intention that the summer camps would be regionally spread. And I know from my own experience um, how important it is to give opportunities to rural communities. Um, I've said many times before that it's not the case that rural communities don't experience community relations issues, it's just that they manifest themselves differently. And I visited a camp during the week in, in my own area of South Armagh, in Kingsmill, Silverbridge and Nisle, and some of those young people live 15 miles apart and their experiences would be very different um, from that of someone in Belfast or Derry. And I'm sure the member will be happy to know that there are three very successful camps in his own area, um, but the summer camps applications were assessed by regional panels with local representatives. Um, and the highest quality applications were accepted across each of the, uh, the education and library boards across um, the district and they were selected for funding. But the, the need for rural proofing was very much built into designing this year's programme and there is an, an issue, a rural issue statement available now on the executive website with the detail of that. Call Mr Cockle Boylan. Kesht ever at all. Let a halt. Question number two, please. All uh, 80 million pounds allocated by the executive to the social investment fund has now been committed to projects to improve the quality of life for people living in uh, targeted areas of uh, deprivation. The remaining letters of offer issued last week, including commitments for the Lanyon Tunnels, St Comgill's projects and the Thomas Davis project in the southern zone. Not only are all projects now committed, but delivery is also progressing at pace. 38 projects worth over 48 million have commenced delivery, and 15 projects worth 26 million are operational. Uh, this includes four capital projects which have completed construction and are delivering vital services in local communities. Success currently equates to over 800 people benefiting from paid work placements and training to support employment worth £18.5 million, and over 80 have already secured jobs. Over 1,300 children and families benefiting from early intervention projects with 5.7 million allocated to support physical, intellectual, social and emotional development. Almost 1,000 children and families benefiting from dedicated educational support projects worth 5.5 million. The Social Investment Fund will continue to grow in success as more projects uh, commence and become operational this year. Mr Boylan, first supplementary. Uh, could I thank the Minister for his response, but just could I ask the Minister to uh, highlight some of the successes on that programme? Well, well, I think the, the greatest su success of the social investment uh, programme was the fact that we went out, not with a top-down approach, but we went out to local communities to ask them what their needs were and how we could prioritise uh, what their preferred uh, projects were. So the Social Investment Fund has allocated £60 million to community projects, and I think this is proof that this executive is responsive to community needs and committed to promoting equality and opportunity for all. Our focus beyond spend, however, should also be on the difference that the fund is making and will continue to make in our communities. And this fund is seeking to build confident and resilient communities. It seeks to invest in community assets and create pathways in training and employment. Indeed, the delivery model developed by SIF is itself a model for future working, a model that engages local people to identify priorities and to work collaboratively with partners to deliver tangible outcomes. This model of delivery acts as a template for the effective delivery of executive policy. So the legacy of the Social Investment Fund is that it is an investment in the future, an investment in communities, and in the skills and life opportunities of our people. And I've been at a, quite a few uh, of these events where people have effectively graduated through it. And I, I can tell you from first-hand experience and talking to people who have benefited from it, they are deeply appreciative in every section of our community that the SIF programme has uh, dramatically uh, improved the quality of their lives. Uh, Mr Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy First Minister, for your answer. Um, Hope you enjoyed the match yesterday. We're going to get another day out. Uh, can I ask the Deputy First Minister to provide an update on how dormant bank accounts in the north, which amount to some £7 million, will be used for social investment strategies? 
Well, I, I think, I mean, that, that's a, an issue over and beyond the, the whole issue of the money that we have allocated to the Social uh, Investment Fund. Uh, and it's something that we continue to uh, investigate. I know that uh, there have been decisions in the past to utilise whatever funds can be made available for the benefit of local communities. So th that's something that we will continuously keep under review. Uh, on, on the match yesterday, it was a, a wonderful occasion. Uh, Eighty odd thousand people uh, enjoying themselves. If, if you want to know what Irish life is like, go to Crow Park and all Ireland Sunday, whether it be hurling or Gaelic football. Match littered with uh, mistakes, but all the more exciting for that. And uh, as the member has said, we're all looking forward to another day out. Call Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for some of that information. Um, I know that some groups in my constituency of Mid Ulster um, have had to resubmit their applications um, due to costings um, and maybe for other reasons. I wonder can the, the Deputy First Minister inform the House how many groups have had to resubmit applications or resubmit costings and how that will affect the delivery of, uh, of the projects in timeways? Well, I, I think as all of us know that as, as capital projects progress, costs are in many cases increasing. That, that's natural given uh, the time span and all of this. And this is primarily due to the, the passage of time, rising construction costs and unforeseen construction issues, which typically arise throughout the lifetime of the projects. So officials are working closely with the central procurement director, lead partners and project promoters to manage the cost of existing projects as far as possible, and of those currently going through approvals to minimise the potential cost increases of future projects. Similar cost saving approaches are being applied at design and construction stage where possible to minimise the extent of increases in individual projects. We are, however, aware that there is still a likelihood that costs will continue to increase for capital projects and as such we have secured uh, revised business case approval to take account of the increased increased period of the fund, the type of projects being delivered, and the increased budget anticipated to deliver and follow the projects prioritised by local student groups. Uh, we intend to seek executive agreement to amend and increase the social investment fund budget to allow all current <coughs> prioritised projects to be delivered. On the issue of how many groups have been affected, I haven't got that figure off the top of my head, but we'll write to you with an answer. Well, Mr. Edwin Poots. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The match yesterday was a truly wonderful occasion. Seeing United getting beat 3-1 by Watford uh, was, was absolutely brilliant. But um, in terms of uh, the, the, the work that has been done, uh, Deputy First Minister, have you had the opportunity to look at early intervention in Lisburn um, and uh, how it's been supported by, to, to, or, or by, the, by the investment fund? And uh, can the, the, the minister? Uh, look at how this might be rolled out in other parts of Northern Ireland because what you're saying is transformational difference being made to the lives of youngsters um, who are almost destined to fail and who are now will certainly have better educational opportunities and outcomes, uh, better employment prospects and better health outcomes and this is an area that badly needs tackled uh, working class communities right across Northern Ireland. Well, first of all, I think the reference to Manchester United was a low blow, <laughs> but I would expect nothing else. <laughs> anyway, uh, I said before Jose Mourinho was appointed that it was a, a dodgy appointment, and I still think it was. <laughs> but, mo but more importantly, the member's absolutely right in relation to the, the huge benefits that the Social Investment Fund can bring for families uh, and for uh, local communities. Uh, our fund is investing $18.5 in employment focused <laughs> projects and through this currently supporting over 800 people through training and paid work placements. Uh, they are integrating local people with local employers and over 80 people have already secured full time jobs and credit their success directly to their engagement on the fund projects, particularly as most jobs are with the participants host employers. Uh, one of those now employed was previously unemployed for 26 years. And she described in her own words how the programme has impacted upon her life. And I quote, I would never have had the confidence to look for work, go for interviews or do up a CV without the support from the programme. I received excellent support and advice on a weekly basis and it has given me a new outlook on life. I have not only gained employability skills but built friendships and a social life, all thanks to the programme. So 
5.7 million has also been invested in early intervention projects across the social investment fund zone and they're providing a range of family support interventions in schools and communities to support physical, intellectual, social and emotional development. Almost 1,300 participants are already availing of the services and many are sharing positive examples of how the support has helped them. So the members right, what we need to do is uh, learn from these experiences and, and continue to work with communities, particularly communities which are in disadvantaged areas. Call Mr Phillips with. Thank you Mr Speaker. Question three please. Uh, the draft uh, programme for government framework agreed by the Executive on the 26th of May 2016 sets out the ambition the Executive has for all in our society. Its focus is on the major societal outcomes the Executive wants to achieve and it provides the basis for the actions we propose to take over the course of this Assembly mandate to bring about the conditions of well-being we are seeking for our people. Over the course of the summer, a public consultation process was conducted to seek views both on the approach taken in developing the framework as well as on its content. There were over 800 responses to the consultation and in addition to informing thinking on the shape of programme for government, these have been most helpful in developing the delivery plans needed to achieve the executive desired outcomes. So we're very grateful to all the individuals and stakeholders who contributed to the consultation and welcome the overwhelming support shown across all sectors for the adoption of an outcomes-based approach to the new programme for government. The Executive is now finalising its delivery plans and these will be incorporated in the detailed programme which we aim to publish for further public consultation over the autumn period and we anticipate finalising the programme by the end of this year. Mr Smith for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, are the fi Finance Minister's proposal for a one-year budget now agreed executive policy? Uh, and if so, what will be the impact on the programme for government? Well, uh, obviously I think everybody will, will appreciate that as a result of the, the Brexit vote that, that puts us in a completely different situation. Uh, yes, the, the uh, decision by the Finance Minister to go for a one-year budget has been endorsed by the executive. Uh, we, we think that it was... Uh, uh, a sensible uh, uh, procedure, given the uh, uncertainty which overhangs everything that we're dealing with at the moment as a result of uh, Brexit. So I think uh, the, the, the big challenge for us is obviously to ensure that we, during the course of that year, uh, are able to deliver the uh, first-class public services that we're committed to delivering for all of our people, uh, and at the same time try to manage our budget in a way that allows us to uh, be involved in other initiatives which uh, the community, I think, uh, expect. Well, Mr Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the Minister so far for his answers. A key commitment of the draft programme for government framework is to tackle regional imbalance in terms of job creation and investment. And I, coming from Fermanagh South Tyrone, could, could rightly say that I feel our constituency has, has suffered greatly over the years. Twelve months ago now, next month in October, there was 800 teleperformance jobs announced for Enniskillen. And to date, I have no knowledge of, of any uh, job creation in that respect. I wonder, could the Minister give us an update on what the position is with these 800 teleperformance jobs? Well, uh, of course, uh, we're not employers, and uh, we're, we're not the people who are responsible for delivering whenever a company uh, makes a, a public declaration of investing in a particular area and outlining how many uh, people they intend to employ. Obviously there has been some delay in that, but there has been no suggestion that I have heard of that there is a reneging on that commitment. So I'm working on the basis that until such times as people indicate that they're no longer prepared to go along with that, that uh, this will go ahead. Hopefully it can be expedited as quickly as possible. In terms of the whole issue of regional uh, imbalance, Obviously, that, that is something that we are acutely aware of, and particularly so the First Minister and myself. She's from the southwest. I'm from the northwest. So we're all very conscious of the need to ensure that every area uh, gets uh, a, a fair uh, opportunity to uh, profit and benefit from uh, the programme for government and from the budget, which will be aligned with that. 
Call Mr. Christopher Stalford. Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, uh, can the Deputy First Minister confirm that in terms of the process of consultation that has occurred around the programme for government, this is actually the highest level of uh, engagement that there has been in the history of drafting a programme for government, and that by allowing groups to comment on the draft framework and then the draft programme, we are effectively giving consultees two bites of the cherry to make their views known? Yes, I, th I think that's an important point that the member has raised because uh, obviously it's uh, hugely important in putting a programme for government together that there is the widest consultation possible. On, on this occasion, we're going for an, an outcomes-based approach and that is something that has worked. It has worked in Scotland, it has worked in various states in the United States of America, it has worked in Finland, for example. So I think the fact that uh, the consultation that we've had with stakeholders has recorded huge support for this approach, which is actually quite striking when you consider that there are some political parties in this assembly who are in opposition who railed against this approach. I, I think it clearly shows them to be at odds from uh, where the stakeholders are at and where the general public is at. So yes, two, two bites of the cherry uh, is important because it, it, it really does show people in the community that we are listening very, very carefully to what they have to say. Well, Mr. Sean Lynch. John Collier, could the Deputy First Minister outline the next steps to be taken in the PFG process? Well, we're currently finalising our delivery plans and we aim to complete this work in the next uh, few weeks. The delivery plans will be incorporated into the next draft of the programme for government and the revised and expanded document will then issue for further public consultation. Uh, a key feature of this uh, programme for government is its dependence on collaborative working between organisations and across sectors. It is also a programme in which individuals and communities can play an active part. Uh, there have been extensive engagements already with organisations groups and individuals, and both the First Minister and I are very keen that that process will continue. So I, I would encourage everybody, individuals and organisations, to get involved and to put their views forward. Departments will continue to engage with delivery partners and stakeholders throughout the autumn, with a view to refining and enhancing the delivery plans and to ensuring the final programme for government is as robust and complete as possible. So our aim is to finalise a new programme for government and have it endorsed by this Assembly before the end of the year. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I note that the Deputy First Minister, or perhaps this week we should refer to him as Your Highness, um, has said that it's very important um, that we have outcomes-based measures, and we agree with that as a party. We believe this is the right approach. One of the ways of ensuring those outcomes are met by departments is to ensure that the quarterly monitoring rounds are used effectively by committees to measure that departments are meeting the targets that they have set. Can the Minister re reassure us that those quarterly monitoring rounds will continue to be presented to committees as there appears to have been a problem with that um, over the June monitoring round? Well, I think obviously there, there was a problem over the June monitor round, and uh, I, th I think that we will do everything in our power to ensure that, that we meet the requirements of, of the committee. Uh, obviously, we have a challenging situation before us in relation to the, uh, the outcome of the Brexit, for example. But uh, I think that, you know, quite clearly, it's uh, very, very important as we go forward that the uh, programme for government and the budget. Uh, meets the needs of, of the committees in, in this assembly and, and I am for one very determined that the committees are accorded the, the respect that they deserve. Uh, they're as much uh, a part of this whole process as anybody else and it's very, very important that they have uh, an input into what we're trying to do. As for Your Highness, the less said about that the better. Call Mr Jim Allister. If the implementation of the programme for government requires any fresh legislation on any subject, <laughs> will the introduction of that and the processing of that be left to this House, this Legislative Assembly? Or does the Deputy First Minister anticipate again donning his royal persona 
and, and changing legislation by royal prerogative. So is the Deputy First Minister intending to further abuse the royal prerogative by upsert, upsur, uh, usurping the legislative functions of this House? Well, uh, I suppose the member is speaking about the appointment of uh, David Gordon. And uh, for, for me, that, that's not the issue here. The, the issue is the relationship and the new dynamic of politics. And some members would do well to remember that the world uh, extends well beyond the gates of Stormont. We are committed to creating and attracting new and better jobs, improving our public services, investing in our schools, our hospitals, our roads, and supporting the most vulnerable across society. And it would, it would appear, though, that some member of the opposition has only woken up with the appointment of a press secretary. There was absolutely no secrecy or underhand dealings. The appointment... <laughs> well, look, some, some uh, minority members can laugh all they like, but uh, the appointment of the press secretary was legally compliant. We have 55 press officers working in government press offices. Yes. Yes, 55, not the inflated figure some others are trying to use. And perhaps if people ask the question rather than run to the media, they might get to the truth, or maybe they don't like or want the truth. Anyway, the, the important thing is that we're continuing to move forward. And uh, I also uh, was made aware just within the last half hour that the prerogative powers in section 23.3 have been used on a number of occasions. And, uh, Amongst the orders that were found was one, the Commissioner for Public Appointments Amendment Order, brackets Northern Ireland 2001, was signed by both David Trimble and Seamus Mallon. Before I call Mr William Humphrey for the next question, I should remind members that the, Mr Humphrey's question is a constituency specific question. Mr Humphrey. Thank you Mr Speaker. Question number four. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Farron to answer this question. Strategic frameworks for all five ur urban villages have been launched. These have been shaped by local communities and reflect their ambition to realise the full potential of the people and places where they live. The frameworks identify collaborative opportunities in each area and provide a roadmap for a comprehensive and joined up approach by departments and wider stakeholders to build community capacity, foster positive community identities, and improve the physical environment. In Ardoin and Greater Ballysillan, this means a planned £300,000 investment in this financial year on a range of public realm and environmental improvements. This includes starting work on a new play park in the Glen Brenn Estate. Work is also ongoing to shape community-based projects to enhance local partnerships and better ways of working together. This year in Ardoin and Ballysillan, it will include a focus on initiatives supporting education and learning, women as community and peace builders, and working with young people. Over the next four years, subject to final budget decisions, we expect a substantial programme of capital investment in urban villages, which would see in the region of 45 million in total, delivered in partnership with other departments and local councils. Crucially, the strategic framework will help to align effort by a range of stakeholders across all urban village areas and enable current and future investment to be delivered in more effective and sustainable ways. Mr Humphrey for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Junior Minister for her answer. Can I ask the Junior Minister uh, to advise the House in terms of the £45 million, pounds, to, if she could expand on the, the larger uh, investments there will be in terms of community infrastructure and capital in investment, and also if there is a time scale for the completion of the investment, which I welcome absolutely. Both areas are hugely deprived and in much need of that investment. I thank the Member for his question. Um, Hopefully by the end of this year there will be 3.6 million capital funds spent and 1.6 million resource and supporting um, local projects on the ground to enable each of the areas to get ready for the delivery of the overall urban village project. In terms of um, Ardoin and Ballysillan in particular, um, we are hoping by the end of the current financial year that there will be 300,000 spent and some of the projects currently being considered there are um, remedial works at the Crumlin and Leganeal Road Junction. A play park in the Glenburn neighbourhood, <coughs> improvements to the Marabone Millennium Park, such as landscaping and a play area that will enhance service provision there, and other works in Ballysillan Park, including new surfaces, planting, signage and public art. Um, but I would say to the member that the urban villages um, are just part of a bigger strategy and that I look forward to 
um, support from all political representatives to every single headline commitment under TBUC, um, and that does include barrier removal. And I'd be very happy to speak to the member about that as well. Time for a quick question from Carl McQuillan and a quick response from the Minister. Um, well, thank you, very, thank you very much. In response to the follow on from William Humphreys, question Could the Minister outline the importance of community participation in the urban villages and indeed the TIPA programmes? Thank the member for her um, question. Just like to, at, at the outset, just say that I think the executive endorsement of the urban villages uh, framework last week was hugely important, and it does allow now our departments to work um, together in a truly collaborative way to deliver on the urban village initiative. Um, and I think engagement with communities is absolutely key. Um, and I think the local reference groups have been um, key to advance in that, and they have a function to keep all stakeholders updated um, on progress of each of the projects. And I suppose experience shows us um, that we, it, we achieve better outcomes and, and better progress whenever we actually involve and engage and, and allow lo local people to be um, involved in decision making, um, particularly decisions that affect their everyday lives in their local areas. Um, we're very committed to building on the foundation of community participation um, and to build on the momentum of TBOC, which has really taken off in, in recent times. But I do think that community involvement is particularly important when we're engaged in a process of community transformation um, and on our work to build a better future, whether that be um, barrier removal, uh, like we've seen on the Crumlin Road earlier this year, or indeed the huge um, participation that we've seen across the north in our summer camps. Um, and later this week, the executive will host the Belfast launch of the Urban Villages Framework. And I'm sure that members across the house would be um, welcome to attend that to show their support for this uh, initiative. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could the Deputy First Minister confirm what powers David Gordon will have in his role at the executive's, as Executive's Press Secretary that Stephen Grimison did not in his capacity as a civil servant? Well, it's, it's not a matter of uh, what powers David Gordon will have. The, the responsibility that David Gordon, as a spokesperson for the executive, uh, will be to work very positively and constructively with everybody in the Executive Information Service. So it really doesn't concern me whatsoever because I am absolutely convinced that uh, the EIS and David Gordon will work uh, very positively together uh, with, uh, in mind, their uh, job description, which is about presenting for the public consumption all of the tremendous work that has been done. Uh, both by the uh, well, by the executive, by individual ministers, but also putting the assembly in, in a good light, because it uh, brings a different dimension, a different level of expertise, to uh, what is a very challenging job. Ms. Dobson, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's certainly a lesson how to spin a spin doctor. Uh, however, as we know, the role was created using the royal prerogative. So can I ask you, as a proud Republican, could you confirm how you feel about exercising the powers of monarch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel grand. <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely grand. Anything, anything that uh, benefits the working of the executive and, by extension, the lives and enriches the lives of the people that we represent is a good thing. I've done many things over the course of the last 20 years, none of which, none of which I'm ashamed of whatsoever, because I think my contribution uh, to this process has put us all uh, where we are today. And even though we have some cat calling from the back benches, uh, they should remember that they wouldn't be sitting on the back benches if it wasn't for the work that I and others within Sinn Féin and within the Republicans have been involved in. So I am not in the least concerned about this debate around David Gordon's appointment. As far as I'm concerned, uh, looking at the way this has developed, mostly on the social media, it's all about the anorex. It's all about the opposition. And we have been criticised uh, whenever we had a five-party coalition for being dysfunctional and not being able to take decisions. Well, now we have a two-party coalition, and we're taking decisions, and we're being criticised. Well, the opposition parties need to remember this. We're going to take more decisions, and more decisions, and we're going to show 
that we can work together as political parties, and we will leave, we will leave the opposition parties who have been uh, very quick to jump out of the executive because of the, the very poor elections that they had in our trail. Call Ms. Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the weekend, um, I had the privilege of participating in the Alzheimer's Society's memory walk in this very state. It was clear from the numbers present just how many people this horrible disease impacts. Um, I understand there's a dementia services strand as part of the Delivering Social Change programme. Would the Deputy First Minister please outline um, what the Executive Office has put in place in this regard? Well, I, I think the previous First Minister and myself, Peter Robinson, were very much involved in the uh, announcement of that, and Atlantic Philosophies were, were very much involved also in contributing to it. Uh, and the member is absolutely right. The, the whole issue of dementia and Alzheimer's uh, represents a huge challenge, uh, not just to our health service, but to our society as a whole over the course of common years. Uh, and of course, great efforts are being made to try and find uh, a cure for that. Huge expenditure has gone into assessing whether or not it is possible to find a cure or to find uh, the type of drugs that would be required to slow down uh, the onset of these uh, terrible diseases. Uh, there also was a, a very well attended uh, walk in the, the dairy area, and Martina Anderson, uh, our locally elected MEP, whose mother suffers from this, uh, was there with the, the entire family. So, no family is untouched by any of this, and it's a huge responsibility on all of us to do everything in our power to ensure that we, for example, from our own lights here in the uh, Assembly and in the Executive, are contributing to, to what must be an overall effort to find ways forward which uh, relieve the burden on families and the suffering of patients. Responding for supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And from what he has outlined, um, what does he anticipate will be the tangible impacts of this strand on people and their families um, who suffer from dementia? Well, I, I think the, the tangible impact has to be how we can relieve people suffering, how we can help those who care for them. And uh, of course, uh, during the uh, course of, of her work, Michelle O'Neill, our, our health minister, uh, as, as well as the responsibility we all have, various stakeholders who have contributed to the discussion around the programme for government, uh, continuously explore what more we can do as an executive and as an assembly to contribute in a positive way towards uh, relieving people's uh, suffering. So that, that is obviously representing a huge challenge uh, for us, but I mean, l larger countries than ours uh, and uh, much more people with much more expertise uh, are working day and daily to find uh, a way forward on this. And uh, every couple of months you do hear about uh, new developments uh, which require years of testing, but uh, we will uh, just have to, in the meantime, ensure that we contribute in the best possible way uh, that we can. Uh, and of course, the project that we were involved in with Atlantic Philanthropies uh, is uh, benefiting uh, people here to some degree. Mr. Steve Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Deputy First Minister, it was good to hear you talk about the world outside Stormont. And I'd like to ask you what further advice we can expect from Kim Jong-un on message management within the Northern Ireland Executive? Well, I, I know the Ulster Unionist Party went into uh, opposition at, at the time of the last assembly, and they weren't the only party to do so. I think that sort of language uh, really doesn't reflect the importance of the work that we're doing here in this uh, assembly. You see, just like that remark, there were many remarks like that prior to the election, and they came mainly from the opposition parties, and they were pitched at the electorate, but it didn't work. When it came to the election, the people of the north of Ireland decided that they wanted Sinn Féin and the DUP to be in the lead. So they have more faith in us than the opposition parties have. So I'm not going to rise to uh, that sort of language 
it, it's all silly, it's childish, and it certainly shows how distant some of the opposition parties have become from where the people are at. It's only a few months since the election. People give us a, a, you know, a, a tremendous endorsement, their faith in us to take this process forward. And of course, we know that the opposition parties wouldn't come into the executive because they didn't get the result that they wanted. And they hope by staying out that they will make gains between now and the next assembly election. God help them. Well, Mr. Aiken, for a supplementary. Yes. Uh, can the Deputy, Deputy First Minister, and thank you for those words, give assurance that the appointment of David Gordon has been conducted, listen, within the correct employment and equality legislation, and as a member of the government, he, has been a, he will be appropriately security vetted, as he will have access to classified and commercially in confidence documentation. And will the Deputy First Minister confirm to this Assembly that the appropriate due diligence has been carried out. Well, I wonder the people who were appointed as advisors to the Ulster Unionist Party during the lifetime of the last term of the Assembly, if they were security vetted by anyone, and if not, why there wasn't a demand from the Ulster Unionist Party that that be the case. No, this is all nonsense, folks. It's all a two-day wonder. The reality you have to deal with is that uh, David Gordon will soon be in post. Uh, we have every confidence in his ability to do the job. And I think that the fact that he is going to do the job is what's scaring uh, the opposition parties more than most. Oh, Mr. Paul Frey. Uh, and BBC, uh, good morning, Ulster, this morning. It was reported of an incident of hate crime at a local tourist uh, location in my constituency. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister, what is the Executive Office doing to, first of all, reduce hate crime and encourage community relations, and second of all, to reassure members of the public? Well, I absolutely and roundly condemn any hate crime anywhere, and I'm sure it's not just restricted to the members' constituency. Uh, we, we all have it in probably every constituency throughout the North. Uh, First Minister and I were very delighted uh, last week to attend and speak at the inaugural meeting of the uh, new racial equality subgroup, which was very, very well attended. So I think we're very conscious of the need to ensure that we give uh, as much support uh, that we possibly can to those people who may be targets of uh, racist thugs. There, there's obviously a huge responsibility on our police service to ensure that they are very proactive in trying to apprehend those who are involved in these criminal uh, and cowardly attacks on defenceless people. So working with the police, uh, working with the uh, representatives of the, our ethnic communities, I, I think it's very, very important that we continue to stand together and to send out a very clear message that uh, such behaviour is absolutely despicable and should stop. Mr. Frew for a supplementary. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker and the Deputy First Minister. The, the First Minister, Deputy First Minister will be aware of the work of the Bellamina Interethnic Forum uh, in the Midden East Antrim Council. And whilst the figures for hate crime has risen, uh, something like it is 87% in the last five years, in Bellamina and Mid East Ant and East Antrim, it has actually reduced dramatically. Uh, what support or what more support can the Executive Office give to groups like the Bellamina Ethnic uh, Under Ethnic Forum to help and assist them in the work that they're doing? Well, we will give every support, and I want to pay tribute to, to that group for the tremendous work that they are involved in. And I know that in every part of the north of Ireland, uh, there are people from both the unionist and the republican nationalist community who are working uh, together to, to send out a very powerful message to our ethnic minorities that they are you know, hugely respected, they are much loved, make a massive contribution to our society, they enrich our society, our, our uh, meat processors, our agri-food industry would come to a halt if these people was through their labour and went back to their own countries. So it's hugely important that we do everything in our power to support local communities who recognise the massive contribution that they make. And of course, we have policies and we have strategies through the uh, racial equality strategy and all strategies, but also working with the police to ensure that we continue to bear down uh, and to make it clear to those. And they are only a tiny 
minority within our society who believes that it's uh, you know, bravo to attack somebody who is uh, you know, thousands of miles from their own countries and who are basically defenceless. So I have great faith in our own people, both in the unionist and the nationalist Republican community, that they will continue to work together to defeat these people. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Deputy First Minister, can you inform the House on what progress has been made on disbanding uh, parliamentary organisations? Yes, well, I, I think everybody knows that during the course of the fresh start uh, negotiations, uh, the uh, political parties, mainly uh, the DUP and Sinn Féin, uh, came to an agreement. We established a, a three-person panel to bring forward uh, a strategy. It's a strategy that we have accepted in total and are absolutely committed to implementing. So that work will roll out over the course of the next while. Uh, and of course, working very closely with the uh, police service, it, it's very, very important that we send a very clear message to the tiny minority that now exists within our community that being involved in criminality or paramilitary activity of any description is uh, a total abhorrence for the people who uh, want to get on with their lives and want to build better futures for their children. So I think that the work that was done was good work. I think the report that was brought in, which had many proposals, all of which have been accepted by the First Minister and myself, uh, will be of huge benefit to uh, the people that we represent as it rolls out. Time, time is up. don't have time for supplementary. I'll